anyway, we're looking at the, the final, this part of the final exam, and I just want to continue for a moment. You'll see that I have grouped the categories of terms according to the nature of magical realism. The second is according to the historical context of some of the fiction that you treated in your web papers. Number three is the relation of the visual arts to magical realism. So it deals with artists and writers and their relation one to another or uh, groups to groups. And then, so you'll see Schul Solar, Pedro Figardi, Frida Kahlo, and you'll find these websites because you're going to read them all through. And then one more poltergeist, which didn't quite fit anywhere. And then an extra credit. I decided uh, just to, for the fun of it to ask you to look rather carefully at one very interesting site where there are four saints compared to, well, I'm not going to tell you. You have to find that out. Now, there are a couple technical details. There are two sites. You see them there. You'll come up with a blank page when you click the user ID, but there is a blue word in the upper right-hand corner. In Jason's case, it's the name of the artist he's working with. In Ruth's case, it says Ruth's website. You'll see it, and then you click on those, and then you're into the web paper. Um, Norma Muñez Yos has only one page on hers. I just wanted to make, Norma has the most fabulous website on our, the other class that she's taking from me, so um, she's, she's working on this one, but I didn't want you to be frustrated and think you were missing out, with, out on part of her paper for technical reasons. Any comments or questions on this uh, part of the final? I expect you to take it seriously. I expect you to come in on December 9th with a hard copy of your answers numbered 1 through 22 or 23 if you decide to exercise your option for extra credit. I want about a paragraph on each. I want you to engage the argument of the web paper where you find the term. So ID and give the significance of is perhaps a limited way to say this and that's why I put all that bold face up there in that third paragraph. I want you to read these, digest them. It's an enrichment for the curriculum of our class. So many of them are so good that I again congratulate you on your, your work. I, the, the web papers are really quite wonderful, most of them. Okay, let's finish up the House of the Spirits, but first let me ask you questions, complaints, comments. Someone's supposed to say, what's the final going to be like? You'll give the user ID. In some cases, the author hasn't put his or her name on the website, but the user ID I would like, yes. Yes, um, Damon. Yeah. Push. It's down at the bottom there. Yeah, push that little thing. Do you want us to write a paragraph for every single one of these? Well. No yes. offense. No offense. Well, you have until the ninth a paragraph. Now, what does a paragraph mean to you? Uh, Three to five sentences. <laughs> Three to five sentences. Adequately answering the. Yeah, to me a paragraph means a complete treatment of a topic, which is what it means in any essay as well. You have a topic sentence of a paragraph and then you develop that topic. So I suppose you would start by saying the Baroque is a historical movement in the 17th century in Europe and then you would give some more details about the Baroque. Important painters are Rubens and Caravaggio and so forth and it happens to be a great site brand. So <laughs> that's Brent's site. And I'm very interested in the Baroque, and I found his site very interesting. And so what I want you to do is prove to me you know what the Baroque is according to Brent's treatment of that topic. Now, I should think in three to five sentences you could manage that, couldn't, don't you think? Yeah, I was just curious. Yeah, because you were thinking that it was way, 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 way too much work. Is that it? I no, I was just unclear in the what? definition. I was unclear in the definition. I just saw all these numbers. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad you asked. That perhaps clarifies things. Yeah. Yes, Kathy. So what about the final? And then the final. Yes, I was going to talk about that before we finish off Isabella Allende um, and ourselves. It's always the last moment to rush, isn't it, at early December? Um, I haven't written the final yet, but there will be at least one essay question. Of the sort you'll recall from your midterm when I asked you to define magical realism historically and then treat a couple of examples. I don't know what the one essay question will be yet. 
I shouldn't think it's about defining magical realism because you've already, already done that. The final will cover the material we've read from the middle of the semester on. I'm going to let the midterm stand for the first half of the semester. So there will be one, maybe two essay questions and then a few identification and give the significance of passages that are important that we've discussed in class that you should have underlined in your text and should have a sense of why they're important. To the, to the work. So it's a bit like the midterm, which is, I believe was two essay questions and four ID uh, passages. I'm hoping that it won't be longer than two hours because you will have spent, I mean, you have 44% of your exam in front of you now, so this is going to be a little more than 50%, so I'm not going to make you slave away all three hours, I hope. I mean, you can have all three hours, but I'm going to make it a little shorter than if I weren't giving you part of the exam right now. Yeah, Megan? Are we, are we starting with Kingdom of the World? Kingdom of the World? Yes, and the essays, and Carpentier's essays. essays. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, and Keche? Oh, it's in this room, so it's closed. Uh-huh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Push the button just in case our viewers next semester want to know how you're doing on your exams here. Yeah. The time, again, you said was from 11 to 2? Yep. Because I had another test that started at 1, so I didn't understand how they overlapped. That shouldn't be because um, the exam schedule goes from 11 to 2, 2 to 5, 5 to 8, and so forth. So I don't understand how that... He told you that they started at 1. It starts at 2. My other class is 2 to 5, it happens. So I can't understand how he can start at 1. Well, good news. You'll probably be out of here because I'm not going to make it a three-hour exam. So um, you can... I always get terrified that, you know, I'll go to the wrong room on the wrong day and then you'll be here the right room on the right day wondering where your final exam is. But if we can all agree that no matter what's right or wrong, we'll all be here on Friday, December 9th, Tuesday, I'm sorry, final, it says, December 9th, Thursday, um, 11 to 2. Here, in this room. Bring a blue book or you can just use paper. I don't care about that, but whatever you think. Okay. Yes, Richard. Uh, this is totally extraneous. What was it called when the when the artist like had a uh, a picture within the picture? Ah, well, we discussed two different ideas along those lines. I th mise en beam. Am I, and I think that's one of the things I ask you. Is that one of the things I ask you to identify? No, you got lucky. <laughs> Darn it! I should have. Now let's see, who deals with that. Uh. The, re the reason I was actually asking, though, is because if they just panned the camera over a little bit, yeah. like yeah. the TV would be, we could see the TV in the TV, and I've been wondering all semester what that would look like. Oh, it happened. It happened. Yeah. Yeah. You know, now I'm looking at this and I'm getting very worried. Do you think you could do that? <laughs> You know what? I'm going to have you cross out some because I don't think there. Now, do, who wrote on United Fruit in here? You did. Okay, that's fine. But the Spanish horses and Spanish bulls and Salem witches need to go. Actually, I don't see anything about Rousseau. Right, <laughs> yes, and Rousseau should absolutely be there. Would you, please? This is fine, thank you. I'm just realizing that I, I'm putting a couple there, and now I wonder if I have Rousseau on my <laughs> other. Yeah, thank you, Anne, that's great. Have one of those, yes, absolutely. No, I'm sorry, yes, let's, yes, thank you so much. Would you cross out number 12, Spanish horses, and put Rousseau, R-O-U-S-S-E-A-U, -S -S -E and his first name is Henri, H-E-N-R-I. Now, we don't want the Spanish bulls or the Salem witches. We don't want the Spanish horses or the Spanish bulls or the Salem witches. <laughs> You'll be happy to hear. Now, the rest are from, oh my gosh, Figari is your, from your others. I've just, but I, does anybody deal with Pedro Figari? Oh yeah, thank you, Jeff. We just gave it away. Thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah, that is from yours, but it's also from Jeff's. Don't you do candombe? Yeah. Sometimes just to fiddle around, I put two concepts. But yours, yours has a footnote or a, a link to candombe, does it not? Yeah. So that that's correct. I'm sorry. I just let some of them overlap. Who doesn't see? Who has a website here? Who doesn't see something on this list from yours? I tried to do every website. Do you see an item from yours that everybody? Is the answer yes? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for pointing out Rousseau. Yours is a great site. I would hate not to direct people there. Figari, she did a fabulous site, but in the other class. But you did Figari too. Yeah. Okay. So I'm okay. So which one is which, though? Because there's. Well, these are all good. Okay. Except, I want you to cross out. 12, 13, and 14. Those are not good. And in 412, I want you to put in Henry Rousseau. Right. So, and then we're just going to reduce the number by 2. I don't know so how that happened. I know. Yeah. That's the trick. Uh, so, yeah. so, sometimes, so sometimes, yeah, you get cited twice. Yeah. And there are a couple others of you where I've done that too. Ah. I don't think Bernal Diaz del Castillo and Hernán Cortés belong in this class either. They do? Okay, thank you. You see, the overlap from my two classes is, is uh, as you see, confusing. Everybody is represented here, correct? Okay, so everybody's website will be read by everybody else, which is the idea. Yeah, like number four, for example, science fiction. That's a huge category. So you're going to go to the site that deals with magical realism and science fiction, and there you're going to have to, you know, really give me a nice bit because it's a very complicated and very good website. I mean, complicated in the sense that there's a lot of thought and a lot of directions in which that site goes. So that kind of thing. Alrighty. So we're going to end up with a total of 21 instead of... 23, but the tw number 23 will still uh, be extra credit. So I'll reduce the numbers of points or I'll fiddle, fiddle with it one way or another. Okay, sorry about that. Now, let's, let's do try to get on to Isabel Allende. Where do you want to start? Do you have a um, starting point? I thought we'd look if anyone wants to look at a passage that we haven't looked at, raise an issue we haven't raised. Certainly there are lots of issues in the novel. But I thought we would look at the poem that I gave you last time. Does anybody need that? Okay, let me give you one. I have more. Ruth, you needed one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, Catherine. Um, what do you want to do? <laughs> Which is easiest? Just, just leave. Why don't you just put, put 13 and 14 with a line and then keep on with the right numbering? Thank you for asking that. Yeah, who else needs a copy of the poem? Which, Stephen, which, oh no, we'll just throw this back. Here we go. Gonna float it out. Everybody got one now. Going back, going back. Are there two there? One more. Oh. Okay. <laughs> what? You see, I'm not capable of this work. <laughs> what, what have I done wrong? Oh, perfect. Then the numbering comes out right. There's no six to eight. See, I took my other class and I used it as the model and I got totally confused. You're so right. You know what I'm going to do is I'll just redo the math. Forget, do five and then go to nine. In other words, you use the number that goes with the thing on this. And then we'll, we'll redo the, the points. It's still going to be 40 at least points of your exam. It may, since I've got less, I less items than I thought. Everyone is represented. I'm going to ask it one more time. You're sure. You see something from your site here. 
Everyone, good. That's my main, my main objective. Thank you, Catherine. I'm going to use you as a proofreader, if you don't mind, for my future projects, <laughs> including my exams. Let's, let's look at this. Um, this is Pablo Neruda's uh, poem, which serves as the epigraph, the first five lines, serve as the epigraph to the novel. Take a look. I mean, you've got the first five lines on your piece of paper in front of you. Um, and we'll look at the whole poem, and we'll try to decide what it means for the novel as a whole, why Allende chose this poem and not another. Um, first of all, we did say a word or two about Pablo Neruda, did we not, when we looked at the sections where his most moving funeral is is recounted. Did we look at that? Okay, let's do it. We'll do it before we look at the poem. Go to your page 282. Here we get a cameo appearance of Neruda. And he's referred to as the poet with a capital P. Neruda died about a dozen days after the military coup in Chile. So let's say something like September 20th, 1973. We know that it was September 11th, 1973 that the coup occurred. Neruda had won the Nobel Prize about two years before. He is probably the greatest poet of Latin America in the 20th century. If you haven't read his work, I recommend that you do so. Um, I took this, as you see, from a book that's called Selected Poems. There are lots of his translations of his work. His 1950 book like this is probably his magnum opus called Canto General, General Song, where it, he really does do a poetic history of um, Latin America. So there are sections on Uruguay, sections on Chile, Argentina, and so forth. Um, the most famous and translated passage, in fact, a whole book about the translation has been written, is the part called Las Alturas de Machu Picchu, which will uh, interest some of you perhaps, the heights of Ma Machu Picchu. Um, the great indigenous site in Peru. So he was a great singer of Latin America, and in fact Allende is going to use a phrase something like that. So let's just look at, there are three passages then that we'll look at and then look um, at the poem. It's uh, the top of your page 282. This is where um, Clara Alba is a little girl, and we know that the poet is a friend of Esteban Truevas, as different as their politics are. By the way, has anybody seen the movie Il Postino, The Postman? It's about Neruda. It's a very beautiful uh, movie. I strongly recommend it to you. Um, Il Postino, or The Postman. Uh, it's, it's set in Italy. In fact, the, the book that was written, that it's based on, by a Chilean <coughs> writer named Scarmeta, um, actually deals with, with um, Neruda's house by the sea, which that is his Chilean home on the Isla Negra, I think it's, it's called, the black island that is off the coast of Chile. But never mind, the setting in Italy is fabulous, so, so do see that movie. And you'll see he's a heavy set older man, as he was in real life in the film, and he's very wise and he strikes up a friendship with a, the postman, and there's a great deal of talk about poetry and the sea and the landscape and so forth. So I, I super recommend it. Um, okay, top of 282. Among them was the poet. No, go up one sentence before that. Almost all the important people in the country took turns living there in this house on the corner, or at least attending the spiritualist meetings, the cultural discussions, and the social gatherings. Among them was the poet years later considered the greatest of the century and translated into all the known languages on earth, on whose knees Alba often sat, little suspecting that one day she would walk behind his casket with a bunch of bloody carnations in her hand between two rows of machine guns. Now we're going to see that, and you'll remember we see that scene later in the novel, and we'll look at it in a minute. But now go to 362, if you will. It's 
the long um, paragraph that begins, in the following months, the situation deteriorated greatly. Do you find it on 362? The situation deteriorated greatly like a country at war. Spirits ran high, especially among the women of the opposi opposition who paraded in the streets, pounding their heavy, sorry, their empty pans in pr protest against the sword shortages in the stores. Half the population hoped to overthrow the government and the other half defended it, and no one had time to worry about work. What we see, as you know, is the, con the continual and increasing polarization. You're either far right or you're far left, and there's nothing in the middle. So this half of the popula population was on one side and half on the other, and nobody had time to work, and much less discuss the problem. That's what we're seeing. One night, Alba was astonished to find the streets in the center of the dar city dark and almost deserted. Garbage had not been collected all that week, and stray dogs were scavenging among mountains of waste. Telephone poles were covered with posters faded by the winter rains, and every available inch of space was filled with the slogans of the two opposing sides. Half the street lamps had been smashed and there were no lights on, on in any of the buildings. The only illumination came from a few sad bonfires fed by newspaper and wooden planks around which the small groups that stood guard in front of the ministries, the banks, and the offices were warming themselves, taking turns to make sure the gangs of, extreme, of the extreme right that roamed the streets at night did not jump them in the dark. Alba saw a van pull up beyond before one of the public buildings. A group of young men in white helmets piled out, armed with buckets of paint and brushes, and proceeded to cover the walls with light-colored paint. Then they drew huge multicolored doves, butterflies, and bloody flowers with hand-lettered verses by the poet and appeals for the people to unite. These were the youth brigades who thought they could save the revolution with patriotic murals and inflammatory doves. Alba went up to them and pointed to the mural on the other side of the street. It was stained with red paint and contained a single word printed in enormous letters, Jakarta. What does that mean, compañero? She asked one of them. I don't know, he replied. And none of them knew why the opposition had painted that Asiatic word on the walls. They had never heard about the piles of corpses in the streets of that distant city, Indonesia. At that time, there was horrible repression in Indonesia. Alba climbed on her bicycle and pedaled home. After the gas rationing and the public transport strike, she had unearthed this childhood toy from the basement, her bike, as her only means of getting around. She was thinking of Miguel, and a dark foreboding gripped her throat. We won't read further, but um, you'll see it in the next long paragraph, reference to the president with a capital P. We know that Salvador Allende. The question we should ask ourselves is why Allende doesn't say Salvador Allende, or why she doesn't say Pablo Neruda, any theories on that? Does that change your reading of it, not to know specifically who this poet is, even at the same time he's pointed to if you know anything about Chilean history? How, how, how does that affect you? I mean, I could have asked the same question. Maybe I did when we were talking about uh, 100 Years of Solitude and the Colombian history underneath the veneer of, of Macondo, where Colombia is never mentioned. Yeah, Chris. Do you have a theory about that, this use of allegory to for political purposes, basically? I think it's to make it more universal. Yeah, um, because I think so too. If, if she locates it in one country, then it can automatically be rejected. Yeah. Um, like, uh, uh, I was going to elaborate on that. I, I'm out. Yeah, OK. <laughs> but I, I, I think that's the first thing. I like to talk about allegory as an accordion effect effect. It has an accordion effect, or I should go like this, between the reader and the text. Allegory can bring you closer. Allegory generalizes. That's what it does. So this president with a capital P means the person in power, let's say, in the military and, and the poet and so forth. It, that has the effect, the generalizing, the abstracting of allegory has the effect of moving the text away. Then, of course, we come right back with Esteban Trueba, whom we know in the, as an individual, and, and Clara, and so forth. So this, this is a, I think it's an interesting narrative strategy for moving the text in and out, or let's say for 
shortening or lengthening the distance between the reader and the text. We see Garcia Marquez do, Marquez do this accordion act in, a, in another way. Remember the we's and the eyes that appear in the text occasionally, and suddenly you're in the community, and then you move back to the third person omniscient. Um, if this were a course in narrative theory, um, or point of view in the modern novel, which is a course I've taught in the past, where we really pay close attention to narrative structure, how the distance is, is a word that we care about. The di we care about tone, we care about diction, we care about lots of things when we're talking about narrative style, um, but in, and we talk about structure and style in separate categories, but a way of structuring the distance between the reader and the, the narrative is the use of a capital letter like P in president or poet. Um, other, other comments, Chris, were you going to elaborate? Yeah, that's, that's, I came across that too. I noticed it whenever I was looking between the two novels for my paper. Yeah. And I noticed that there are, what, 13 brothers and sisters we don't know about yeah. from Duval yeah. family? Yeah. Whereas yeah. there's not anybody left out of the family with uh, the Buendias. Yeah. It's really, that's a nice point. Yeah. It was really interesting. Yeah. It's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Know. Which would then take you to the conclusion, it seems to me, that, that Garcia Marquez's world, first of all, more filled with people and sort of faceless in a way, hard to tell one Aureliano from another, that it is more, it may maintains it's more allegorical. I won't say anti-psychological, but I'll say a-psychological. That's unfair. We know that Ursula is a perfectly nice lady, and we feel sorry for her when she has that blood arrive at her feet and so forth. But what it says to me, that very interesting statistic, which I'd never uh, counted up before, says that in a realistic novel, you can only handle so many individuals. Now that's, you can say, well, what about Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, where there's a cast of characters like thousands, and they are individualized. But the point is you don't have the kind of phantom family that exists in Macondo be because Allende is interested in a more realistic political critique. I think finally Garcia Marquez, he's interested in a critique, but a very general one of American imperialism in in Latin America. I mean, to me that's, and in social chaos of Colombia and a few other things. But I'm sorry, now to say. I uh, it's really interesting because I, I got the exact opposite thing. Oh, you did? Yeah. Tell me. It, uh, because I, I mean, it's the same, it's the thing that it's all the same principles, everything you just said. But then uh. I felt that um, that uh, the Buendias were, were a family. And we, we know a lot about their sufferings and their individual yeah. um, interactions and, and how they grieve well, we one do. another. Yeah. Whereas, um, like, for example, um, whenever um, Clara finally speaks, yeah. the reaction's placid, yeah. you know, yeah. at first. And you kind of have this emotionless state. And, and I was like, well, that's interesting. And, and then uh -huh. I thought, okay, well, Yende's talking about a nationhood while, um, while Marquez is still fixed on the principalities and, and the small communities. Well, there is that, yeah. I think that's a very interesting point. I mean, this is a much more, let's say, globalized novel. We feel, we, we feel that this town, this city, this country is a part of a larger entity. I mean, certainly the Americans are referred to. We do Macondo too with the arrival of United Fruit, but nonetheless it's, um, it's a kind of, it, it's a different feel to it, isn't it? Well, I'm very interested, I mean, I think you can argue both ways. I'm interested in reading your argument. Um, the fact is, as I've said lots of times, comparing two novels is useful because it makes you clearer about each one individually by saying what it's not, or how it's different, or indeed how it's the s same, but usually two novels aren't so much similar as different. Um, so I'm interested in your comparison. Okay, so back to our Pablo Neruda appearances, or I should say the poet's appearances. Go to 387, will you? It's the um, very beautiful and moving passage of the poet's death after the coup. We've just skipped over uh, the coup, the actual uh, event, and we're now seeing this moment when Neruda dies and is mourned by uh, only a few. It's the typographic break 
down. So go to the typographic break. The poet was dying in his house by the sea. He had been ailing and recent events had exhausted his desire to go on living. Soldiers broke into his house, ransacked his snail collection, his shells, his butterflies, his bottles, the ship figureheads he had rescued from so many seas, his books, his paintings, and his unfinished poems, looking for subversive weapons and hidden communists until the old poet's heart began to falter. They took him to the capital where he died four days later. The last words of this man who had sung to life were, they're going to shoot them, they're going to shoot them. Not one of his friends could be with him at the hour of his death. They were all outlaws, fugitives, exiles, or dead. His blue house on the hill lay half in ruins, its floor burnt, its windows broken. Why have they done this? Because he's an important intellectual. He was a great friend of Salvador Allende's. He was a communist. So he's a suddenly enemy of the regime. The military is rounding up intellectuals, rounding up students, rounding up uh, people known and some who didn't have known connections to the opposition party, that is to Salvador Allende's uh, party. No one knew if it was the work of the military, as the neighbors said, or of the neighbors, as the military said. That's a brilliant sentence. Everybody blaming everybody else. A wake was held by those few who were brave enough to attend, along with journalists from all over the world who came to cover his funeral. Senator Trueba was his ideological enemy, Neruda's, <coughs> but he had often had him to his house and knew his poetry by heart. He appeared at the wake dressed in rigorous black with his granddaughter Alba. Both stood watch beside the simple wooden coffin and accompanied it to the cemetery on that unfortunate morning. Alba was holding a bouquet of the first carnations of the season as red as blood. The small cortege walked on foot slowly all the way to the cemetery between two rows of soldiers who'd cordoned off the streets. People went in silence. Suddenly someone hoarsely called out the poet's name and in a single voice everyone replied, here, now, and forever. It was as if they had opened a valve and all the pain, fear, and anger of those days had issued from their chests and rolled onto the street, rising in a terrible shout to the thick black clouds above. Another shouted, compañero presidente, and everyone answered in a single wail the way men grieve, here, now, and forever. The poet's funeral had turned into a symbolic burial of freedom. The cameraman of Swedish tele television, Swedish because of the Nobel Prize, were filming close to Alba, close by Alba and her grandfather to send back to Nobel's frozen land the terrifying image of machine guns posted on both sides of the street, people's faces, the flower-covered coffin, as well as the silent group of women clustered in the doorway of the morgue two blocks from the cemetery reading the names of the dead. Voices mingled in a single chant and the air filled with forbidden slogans as face to face with guns that were shaking in the soldiers' hands. Those beautiful details, yes, shaking in the soldiers' hands. They shouted that the people united would never be defeated. You know, the hopelessness of it all. Yeah, they have been defeated. The cortege passed in front of a construction site and the workers dropped their tools, removed their helmets, and with bowed heads formed a single line. The workers know his poetry. The workers are great fans of his, of, of his, his poems. A man with a, frayed sh a shirt frayed at the cuffs without a jacket and wearing broken shoes marched along reciting the poet's most revolutionary poems, his grief streaming down his face. Senator Trueba gazed at him in astonishment. It's a shame he was a communist, the senator told his granddaughter. Such a fine poet, but such confused ideas. If he had died before the coup, I suppose he would have received a national tribute. He knew how to die just as he knew how to live, Grandfather Alba replied. I think, you know, it goes on. Let's do one more sentence, one more paragraph. He was convinced that he had died at the proper time because no tribute could have been, she, I'm sorry, she was convinced that he had died at the proper time, the poet, because no tribute could have been any greater than this modest procession of a handful of men and women who lowered him into a borrowed grave, shouting his verses of freedom and justice for the last time. 
Two days later, a notice from the military junta appeared in the papers decreeing national mourning for the poet and authorizing those who wanted to do so to fly the flag at half-mast in front of their houses. The permission was valid from the moment of his death until the day the notice appeared. In other words, nobody was going to be flying flags. So, uh, that irony that appears. Okay, let's just look at the poem, and maybe um, if I'd thought of it, I would have put on your, I know, on your web paper that you should look up on the web, uh, Pablo Neruda. Do so. Read a couple of his poems, will you? It's he's, he's wonderful. I won't make it part of your exam, but I know you're all very busy, but I wish I, wish I had thought to somehow incorporate that, incorporate that. This is the best we'll do. We'll read one poem here. Anybody a good reader of poetry here? Who wants to read it? I'll read it. Oh, thank you, Chris. Yes. I like attention. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> we love attention. <laughs> to give you attention, that's great. Start. Okay. How much does a man live after all? Does he live to a thousand days or one only? For a week or several centuries? How long does a man spend dying? What does it mean to say forever? Lost in this preoccupation, I set myself to clear things up. I sought out knowledgeable priests. I waited for them after their rituals. I watched them when they went their ways to visit God and the devil. They wearied of my questions. They, on their part, knew very little. They were no more than administrators. Medical men received me in between consultations, a scalpel in each hand, saturated in almycin. Or your mycin. Or your mycin, yeah. thank you. Busier each day. As far as I could tell from their talk, the problem was as follows. It was not so much the death of a microbe. They went down by the ton. But the few which survived shows, showed signs of perversity. They left me so startled that I sought out the grave diggers. I went to the rivers where they burn, enormous painted corpses, tiny bony bodies, emperors with an aura of terrible curses, women snuffed out at a stroke by a wave of cholera. There were whole beaches of dead and ashy specialists. When I got the chance, I asked them a slew of questions. They offered to burn me. It was all they knew. In my own country, the dead answered me between drinks. Get yourself a good woman and give up this nonsense. I never saw people so happy. Raising their glasses, they sang, toasting health and death. They were huge fornicators. I returned home much older after crossing the world. Now I ask questions of nobody, but I know less every day. Thank you. Yeah. Who wants to hypothesize about the application of this poem, and maybe first the, the, the application of the first five lines to the novel? Why did Is Isabella Allende choose this? I, I like to say that you have to pay close attention to dedicatories, dedications, acknowledgments, and epigraphs, those short, sort of supposedly extra textual texts that go before the text, before the main text, uh, often are very carefully selected. Um, I love myself selecting epigraphs. I, You've taken a look at my books. You know I have epigraphs for my chapters as well as my my uh, the book as a whole because you find something that's said in a slightly different way, but resonates with what you want to say in your chapter. Anybody want to theorize? Richard, <laughs> I can always count on Richard. <laughs> Any theories, Richard? I mean, what's no. this poem about? Give me, a, give, give me a paraphrase of this poem. What is this, the theme of this poem? The theme of the poem is what's the nature of life yeah. and death. What's it all about? Absolutely. Thank you very much. And you can ask all the questions of all the specialists in the world, and you know less and less every day. So it's a kind of, it reminds me rather of Jorge Luis Borges at the end of the Library of Babel, where he says, ah, some, I, I sustain the elegant hope, elegant hope that someday some traveler will come and organize the library, remember? So, so that there are so many questions, and this is about questioning, 
But at the end, we learn that no one has answers and that the speaker, the narrator of the poem, uh, has ceased even to ask questions. OK, thank you, Richard. Now, what might that have to do with the book? So the first five lines, right? Well, the first five lines are the epigraph. She doesn't give the whole poem. And those are, you know, a series of five questions. I mean, Richard, don't think that I have any great answers to this either. I, I, it's not at all clear, especially, have we seen the very last paragraph of the book together? Have we read it together? Very affirming, is it not? Very um, upbeat. I've forgiven... I realize that we're part of a larger order, that someday my granddaughter and Esteban's grand, da, grandson may yet repeat the history, a kind of almost zen giving in to what is a horrible situation. And I saw you over there with your hand. Do you want to address all of this? I mean, it seems a very hopeless poem given the rather hopeful ending of the novel. Um, I think the last four lines on the first page uh -huh. applies to our novel. Okay. Um, Read those for us again, will you? It was not so much the death of a microbe, they went down by the ton, but the few which survived showed signs of perversity. Yeah. Um, the focus on the few. Yeah. Um, we're talking like with, with the witness. Yeah. We know all of them, but we don't know the other um, of Clara's siblings. Um, we're focusing on yeah, yeah, and these are we're focusing on a few, few what, few microbes. That is, that somehow, uh, as much as you want to cleanse or clean something or kill the negative, kill the enemy, kill the evil, whatever, that there's always going to be alternate strains well, that keep popping it up. It puts it in perspective. You know, they yep. went down by the ton. Well. You know, a population yeah. of, of people, but the few, I mean, the few that were important, um, Esteban um, yeah, Garcia, I, yeah. he was rather important, yeah. and um, and I think Clara realized, yeah. or not Clara, but Alba realizes that at the end, yeah. that it's, it's the few that are going to make the difference. Yeah, yeah, and they can make a terrible difference as well as a positive one. Well, thank you. That's very interesting. I'm glad you focused on those, on those lines. Your your reading might extend, might it not, to this thing about, oh, in my country, everyone was so happy, you know, drinking and whoring, as it were. Um, get yourself a good woman and give up this nonsense. The nonsense being seeking the meaning of life. You you might you might extend your argument to that as well. I don't know if 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 that's um, how you read those lines. Yeah, Jeff. I, the novel sort of emph emphasizes like cyclical nature of life, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. nobody ever really has any answers to stop everything that's going on. You know, it's one generation after another yeah. um, with all these horrible things going on. I think in the poem, it's on the the second side. And it says, "When I got the chance, I asked them a slew of questions. They offered to burn me. It was all they knew." Yeah. And that's sort of I, I don't know. I think that's what he's sort of saying about life in general. Is there are no, there is no finality. There's nothing you can say that's going to be like, this is it. This is why you're here. This is what you're supposed to do. Right. You just figure it out for yourself, and you do whatever you know, and that's pretty much how you get by. And I think that goes in hand in hand with the novel. Just that cycl cyclical nature. You're not really trying to meet some ultimate end. You're just yeah living. Living. Yeah. 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 And and the negative aspects of that really, in a way, I mean, we could say, oh, cyclical is wonderful. It's the seasons, the regeneration of spring and all of that. But the cyclical here isn't that kind of cyclical, is it? It's kind of the same old thing. <laughs> Uh, you know, we make, keep making the same mistakes again and again. And there is that feeling about this poem, I think. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you, Jeff. That's interesting. Well, I leave it to you to um, stick this into your novel and keep it with your, your text. Um, we have a, just about 10 or 15 minutes. Let's do what we've d done in the past. I mean, those are kind of the passages that I wanted to cover. There's so, so much more, and there's so many more uh, questions that could be raised. For example, define the magical realism in this novel. Now that it occurs to me, that's not a bad 
way to um, approach one of the essays on the final. It's a different kind of magical realism than we've seen, as much as we're talking about the simil similarities with uh, and differences with Garcia Marquez. Anybody want to talk about that? Yeah, Richard, push your button. Hey question about the details in the story. Did Esteban Chureva ever find out that Esteban Garcia was his uh, illegitimate grandson? You mean after the torture and so forth? Did you ever know that that was his blood relation? I don't think so. Do you, you all know that? Why you named Esteban? He goes, for you. He goes, oh, well, I won't name Esteban after their, you know. Uh, after the patron, patron yeah. Alba well, that's true. Alba knows, of course. Yeah. So Alba knows. I mean, he just recently died. Esteban. I mean, uh, but, yeah. But how does Alba know? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Is the narrators know that? But if, but they also say that Esteban Chureba didn't know that. So how do the na narrators yeah. know that? See, uh, what a very good question. Um, she, clearly, Alba knows it because she addresses that at the, in the last paragraph of, of the novel. But she writes after yeah. Esteban's dead. Well, they, they write together at the same time because Esteban, because Esteban writes some of it himself. So. Right, but she puts it, she puts it together. And, and she even says, I'm writing here as his body's laying in the room. Right, and it is, as we've said, that structure where she begins to write the novel that we've just read. And so... I think the part about Esteban's um, first-person narratives, that we have to take it as a leap of faith, that he hasn't madly written that down on his deathbed, but that somehow we're entering into his mind, even though Alba is given as the overarching narrator. She says, my grandfather and I are writing this, but when did, his, when did that happen? Um, See, that's a, thank you very much for that question. I, I don't know how she finds out either. She would have to find out in the torture chamber somehow. Or maybe, maybe Clara knew, right wrote now. it in her book, and then Alba discovered it, gone through Clara's oh, book. Oh, well, see, that gives, us a logical, uh, that gives us a logical way out. That's true, because it was, we're supposed to suppose that everything in the novel is in the notebook. So we could say, well, Clara somehow knew it. And she would know it, yeah, because Pancha Gar Garcia was very known to everybody. Yeah, and she, she, shunned, uh, she shunned Esteban when they came back from Trace Maria the first time. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Megan? Well, even, even with um, him you know, just knowing little facts like that, he's also very selective in what he chose to recognize yeah. as reality. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have his huge, long paragraph of like revelation or desperation or whatever you want to call it with transito so right and then you have you know also things like like uh, you know how he did he he looked at him and said well yeah everybody names you know their kids after yeah yeah and well, yet we've been told very specifically that he was the only one of the progeny who carried the name Esteban so um, yeah, how very interesting. Next time I read this, Richard, I'll email you if I see any little clues <laughs> to, to this very question. Um, I was just taking it for granted that everybody knew about Esteban because the novel ends on this point somehow. But you're right, it's not at all necessary. It's not sure that, that um, Esteban Trueva knows at all, that his daughter's been tortured by his own progeny. I mean, it really is hard. I mean, his granddaughter has been, trans has been raped, et cetera, by his grandson. I mean, it really does up the horror factor quite a lot, so. I think he's right, though, that you could maybe suspect that she found it in Clara's journals. Yeah. Since Clara was clairvoyant, I mean, it's quite possible that she knew that. Yeah, see that... We could just make that argument for Miss Allende, in case she didn't... Meet yeah, that's right, in case, she didn't think, <laughs> in case she didn't think to do it herself, yes. Yes, well, once you posit clairvoyance on the part of a character, anything goes, doesn't it? Yeah, which is the nature of magical realism. I mean, we haven't talked so much about Clara's cl clairvoyance. When we went through some of the passages, what I wanted to say was how she loses her faith in clairvoyance as the economic and political situation worsens. She sees that this is not, you know, it's a little, a bit um, frivolous in comparison to people's, you know, epidemics and earthquakes and, and broken bones and so forth. So um, her clairvoyance is, is uh, kind of dropped as, as an issue or as a central concern of the novel, as I say long about page 130, 140, um, 
the, the novel takes a turn toward the political uh, and the social commentary uh, as it didn't at the outset. Yeah, Megan? I think Claire is also interesting in the way that she selectively sort of foresees things because I, I don't know why this stuck in my head, but I always found it interesting that she would, you know, see the future as far as um, everything from earthquakes and, and, you know, to who's um, going to become, you know, who's going to win lottery or something like that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when <coughs> Blanca was, when Blanca was pregnant? Yes, when Blanca was pregnant, it only says that Blanca thought that her baby was going to be a girl. And for as much emphasis as they put on her buying and making pink things, I could have sworn it was going to be a boy. <laughs> oh, that's cute. But it ended up being a girl, and it never mentions not once Clara taking any interest in saying whether it was a girl or yeah. what have you. Yeah, interesting. Um, but, but Clara had the dress ready for mm -hmm. the baby girl before the baby was born. See, I think that's part of the counter-realism of this novel. Does not Alba say that she's awaiting her daughter at the end? Now we say, well, sonograms and so forth. But the novel doesn't include that kind of, she just knows, you see. So um, that's kind of the way that both Clara and Blanca are. They just know. Push your little button. I just said sometimes you just know. Like about 50% of the time you're right, put it down. <laughs> well, if I, you, you, did you know that you were expecting a son? No. Oh, I thought maybe you were speaking from your own, uh, Anne has a no, son, a son. I don't know if you have daughters too. Yeah. But. Oh, not if my daughter was a daughter. Oh, you see, I didn't know you had a daughter as well. I just heard about your son. Uh -huh. Her first, but I, I was sure my son was a girl till they told me it was, he was <laughs> and showed me. Yeah. So, yeah. See, what's interesting now, having just become a grandmother, as some of you know, that this uh, in, in October my daughter had a darling little boy. And um, of course it brings back all of one's own experiences. But it's so interesting to know. So you didn't know in advance that your child was one or the other. You didn't get, a, you didn't get information or you, yeah. yeah uh -huh. So you, you thought it was a boy until the sonogram told you it was a girl. It's not the moment of birth where you say, because in my day we only found out when the baby was born. So we were, had. Yeah, could be, could be. <laughs> yeah, what I, I just wanted, I just wanted a boy the second time because I'd had a girl the first time. And I got one. So <laughs> I just wanted one. I didn't have any feeling one way or the other. I just <laughs> knew what I wanted. Um, <laughs> I wanted one of each. OK. Other comments about the novel or passages or places that we haven't talked about? I do feel like it, we've rushed here at the end, but I'm, thank you for your specific comments about the text. Um, we didn't get, as you know, <coughs> to my essay in the anthology, you know, dip into it if you're still interested in magical realism after this class. Um, I think Anne, you, so I'll give away, um, maybe I'll give away Anne's web paper, but um, Anne was very interested in ghosts and looking at the role of ghosts in magical realism, and I like that very much because my essay in the anthology is on that subject as well, and you, you don't tend to have ghosts in realistic fiction except in a subgenre called ghost stories, and those are separate, and those are ghost stories, and yes, ghost stories have ghosts, but in, um, so, so my argument in the uh, article is that when you spot a ghost in a magical realist fiction, you, or in a fiction, you can say something about the nature of the magical realism, and you won't be surprised to hear that I mention Allende in this context, because there are ghosts, most importantly Clara's ghost re appearing to, to Alba. So um, anyway, but we're going to let that one go. And so we're, we're going to have the exam from the essays of Carpentier to Isabella Allende. Isn't she going to be here next month? She is reading on the imprint reading series. Thank you very much. And I believe it is going to be, is it the 21st of March? Do you have that information? 21st of March. I'm not sure. I know Elena Poniatowska, who's a Mexican, is reading. To, you know, they're at the Alley Theater. The f yeah. Um, it's, it's always at the Alley Theater on a Monday night, and thank you, sh sh oh, maybe it's going to be in the Cullen Performance, the very big ones they put in the Cullen Performance Center. 
Oh, good. Thank you. I'm glad to know that. www.imprintreadingseries.org. Yeah. Yeah. Just look up imprint on Yahoo. Yeah, just imprint on Yahoo. Very good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're all caught up. You have your work. I've got your work. Right? I've got all your papers. Anybody missing a paper that I need to have? I did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. One. Oh, one good. Sure. I want the hard copy. If you didn't bring one in Jeff's case, send, uh, Jeff, get it to my box. Yeah. But everybody else's paper I've got, correct? Okay, let's talk. I don't <laughs>